one of the first things that every photographer learns as soon as they pick up the camera is there's a frame. It's a fixed frame. And most people have the same frame. It's a 35 millimeter frame for the most part. And so how do you make your work different from anybody else's? So it's what you put in the frame and it's where you cut the rest of the 360 degrees in all axes, by the way, we're looking at a, <clears throat> a spinning web of 360 degree arcs and you're moving this frame around. And early on, I sensed the power of that in this regard. When you put the frame up to your eye, the world continues outside the frame. So what you put in and what you leave out are what determines the meaning or the potential of your photograph. But you must continue to keep in mind that it's plenty of stuff off stage. And what bearing might the rest of the off stage have on this? So ultimately, when we're thinking about composition, um, we're thinking about a balance of forms within the frame, um, really carefully considering what we're framing, what we're placing within the four corners of our frame, and being very, very aware of looking and noticing things. Um, because photography very much is about looking and noticing the small details or thinking about how you might frame something that might be quite small, trivial, mundane and make it seem exciting and dynamic through purely how it's been framed with the camera. So it's very much about noticing. Um, that might be things like lines, shapes, textures and details or it might be action in terms of a genre such as street photography. Um, the terms we're going to be looking at um, some of them you'll have heard of, some of them are quite self-explanatory um, and they're, they're not set of rules as such, rather they're a set of guidelines and things to be very much aware of. Um, everybody needs to know about them and you should have an awareness of them, but you certainly don't need to sort of live your life by them um, and you certainly do need to not take photographs just because they might not comply with a certain rule or term. Um, but there is an idea that when some of these are followed, that it does create um, good images and you would take better photographs for that. Um, so it can be a combination of many factors um, that gives balance and interest to an image. Um, or it might be really simple, but you're not to be um, daunted by the different terms. Um, nobody's expected to sort of know about them or even remember them as such, um, particularly at first, but you should spend time reading and uh, researching them. And you should also just spend time looking at photographs um, and learning about photographers because the more photographs you look at, the better photographs that you will then ultimately take. Um, so one rule that um, most people or many will have heard of is that of the rule of thirds. And this idea that if we're using um, the rectangle viewfinder, which many cameras do, or majority of what we will be doing do, um, is that this grid divides into nine rectangles. And where you place elements um, within the frame um, can give a certain weight or balance to the picture. Um, so it might be that it's weighted over to the left hand third or the bottom third um, and you might discuss and talk about images like that when you may be um, doing analysis such as in the personal study or in a critical link or just um, talking and describing a piece of work. Um, another thing that you might also talk about are these four intersecting points um, where very often points of interest might fall under um, one of these intersecting points. So the example we've got here is um, Henri Cartier-Bresson and you can see there that the cyclist falls under the top left intersecting point. Um, dividing the frame into thirds, um, you've then got this um, really sort of lovely balance of forms and when you're reading the image, 
most people tend to find that their eye sort of flows from the bottom left of the frame, follows the spiral staircase round, which is also mirrored with that shape of the curb as well behind the cyclists, and the whole movement of the, f of the photograph is being read from bottom left all the way round. Um, and over to the left intersecting point at the top there with the cyclists. Um, you've got all other elements as well going on there. Um, the vantage point is quite important of the photographer if you think where they're positioned and shooting down on the scene, cyclist isn't aware of the presence. Um, you've got the contrast, you've got the repetition of the staircase, you've got that mirroring of the curve from the staircase to the curb behind and you've also got that slight bit of movement that's just been caught um, which really gives the atmosphere of the work and, and there's a contrast as well against the cyclist and the background which is giving you that figure ground um, relationship also. Now another idea that's discussed in composition um, that sort of goes on a step further from the rule of thirds um, is that of dynamic symmetry. Um, and the use of dynamic diagonals in a piece of work, in an image. Um, some of these diagonals, they even have their own names, so just to get even more complicated, um, if we look behind, we've got the Baroque diagonal and the Sinister diagonal, um, and it's often thought of that the Baroque diagonal is the most important one. Um, we tend to read images left to right, not in all cases, but Another reason for that can be that we look at things in the foreground first um, or that we just um, are quite accustomed to reading from left to right um, in the West anyway. Um, so we've got this sequence of diagonals to be aware of as well, positioning things along diagonals. Um, and lots of Cartier-Bresson's images um, often tend to comply with the rule of thirds. Um, and there's lots of examples of the use of diagonals as well. You can see the intersecting points are still there from that thirds grid we just looked at before. You've also got the um, golden section. Now, golden section, ratio, golden rule, uh, divine proportion um, are all the same things. Um, and this number is extremely important to that um, in terms of um, ratio. So, um, found by Leonardo Fibonacci around 1200 AD, but known of centuries earlier. It was very much that he just sort of bought this idea, this sequence of numbers, um, that he bought that and uh, taught it to the West. Um, so known as the Fibonacci series, um, what you've got um, is a golden rectangle. And uh, a rectangle being one of the most visually sort of satisfying of all the geometric forms. Um, now, if you take the rectangle and you make one side of it into a square, the rectangle that's left over is made up of exactly the same proportions as the original rectangle. If you divide that again and again, um, that continues to maintain the same proportions and creates this kind of nesting of rectangles um, and the ratio of 1 to one point. 618. Now that can be found um, in nature, it can be found in, in many different um, places and um, the human body is one of them. Um, art, architecture, so we've got um, da Vinci's piece here um, which quite nicely illustrates as well that ratio um, in terms of the proportions of the human body. Um, so if one was the height from your foot to your navel, then one point one one with the ratio of one to one point six one eight would be your full height. Um, it's also found um, in on the face, um, also that just in limbs. So if the length of your hand was one, then the length from your hand to your forearm is one point six one eight. Um, so this ratio can be found. Um, all over the body. Um, it's also mirrored in nature as well. The actual sequence of uh, Fibonacci numbers are mirrored in nature and found in things like flower petals, sunflower seeds. Um, in the body again, it's found um, in our inner ear, um, the galaxies, um, animals, DNA molecules, um, and also employed 
with the use of building architecture um, going right back to sort of ancient Greeks. Um, the pyramids, uh, the Parthenon, all built with this sort of ratio um, where the ratio can be found. So it's a really, um, a really interesting sequence of numbers um, and also that idea of proportion as well. Um, I don't want anyone to overly worry about this um, but as far as the maths goes let's listen to someone who's a lot more excited about numbers than I am. But wouldn't it be great if every once in a while we did mathematics simply because it was fun or beautiful or because it excited the mind? Now, I know many people have not had the opportunity to see how this can happen, so let me give you a quick example with my favorite collection of numbers, the Fibonacci numbers. Yeah, I already have Fibonacci fans here. That's great. Now, these numbers can be appreciated in many different ways. From the standpoint of calculation, they're as easy to understand as 1 plus 1, which is 2. Then 1 plus 2 is 3, 2 plus 3 is 5, 3 plus 5 is 8, and so on. Indeed, the person we call Fibonacci was actually named Leonardo of Pisa, and these numbers appear in his book, Libera Bacci, which taught the Western world the methods of arithmetic that we use today. In terms of applications, Fibonacci numbers appear in nature surprisingly often. The number of petals on a flower is typically a Fibonacci number. Or the number of spirals on a sunflower or a pineapple tends to be a Fibonacci number as well. In fact, there are many more applications of Fibonacci numbers, but what I find most inspirational about them are the beautiful number patterns they display. Let me show you one of my favorites. Suppose you like to square numbers, and frankly, who doesn't? Let me show, let's look at the squares of the first few Fibonacci numbers, okay? So 1 squared is 1, 2 squared is 4, 3 squared is 9, 5 squared is 25, and so on. All right, now, it's no surprise that when you add consecutive Fibonacci numbers, you get the next Fibonacci number, right? That's how they're created. But you wouldn't expect anything special to happen when you add the squares together. But check this out. 1 plus 1 gives us 2. And 1 plus 4 gives us 5. And 4 plus 9 is 13. 9 plus 25 is 34. And yes, the pattern continues. In fact, here's another one. Suppose you wanted to look at adding up the squares of the first few Fibonacci numbers. Let's see what we get there. So 1 plus 1 plus 4 is 6. Add 9 to that, we get 15. Add 25, we get 40. Add 64, we get 104. Now look at those numbers. Those are not Fibonacci numbers, but if you look at them closely, you'll see the Fibonacci numbers buried inside of them. Do you see it? I'll show it to you. 6 is 2 times 3, 15 is 3 times 5, 40 is 5 times 8, 2, 3, 5, 8. Who do we appreciate? (laughs) Fibonacci, of course. Now... As much fun as it is to discover these patterns, it's even more satisfying to understand why they are true. Let's look at that last equation. Why should the squares of 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, and 8 add up to 8 times 13? I'll show you by drawing a simple picture. All right, we'll start with a 1 by 1 square, and next to that put another 1 by 1 square. Together they form a 1 by 2 rectangle. Beneath that, I'll put a 2 by 2 square, and next to that, a 3 by 3 square. Beneath that, a 5 by 5 square, and then an 8 by 8 square, creating one giant rectangle, right? Now, let me ask you a simple question. What is the area of the rectangle? Well, on the one hand, it's the sum of the areas of the squares inside it, right? Just as we created it. It's 1 squared plus 1 squared plus 2 squared plus 3 squared plus 5 squared plus 8 squared, right? That's the area. On the other hand, because it's a rectangle, the area is equal to its height times its base. And the height is clearly 8, and the base is 5 plus 8, which is the next Fibonacci number, 13, right? So the area is also 8 times 13. 
since we've correctly calculated the area two different ways, they have to be the same number. And that's why the squares of 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, and 8 add up to 8 times 13. Now, if we continue this process, we'll generate rectangles of the form uh, 13 by 21, 21 by 34, and so on. Now, check this out. If you divide 13 by 8, you get 1.625. And if you divide the larger number by the smaller number, then these ratios get closer and closer to about 1.618, known to many people as the golden ratio, a number which has fascinated mathematicians, scientists, and artists for centuries. So, um, that's a little bit more detail as to how um, the mathematics of the uh, Fibonacci series um, creates our golden rectangle and how that ratio um, and that magic ratio of the 1.618 um, came about or exists rather. Um, certainly don't think that photographers go out in search of the golden ratio as such so it's not something I would expect everybody to be going out um, in terms of trying to capture that and, and over worrying about that with their composition but again it's another thing to be aware of the most simplified sort of form and the way to kind of approach things initially would be with the rule of thirds um, many cameras also have the grid lines on um, to sort of help you be a bit more aware about your framing um, but we've got an example there that you can apply the golden section to So um, a few other terms that you might um, look at now. So we've got Alexander Ronchenko's um, work and here looking at that use of the diagonal, um, the position of the photographer, so a low vantage point, um, creating that perspective on the actual building where it looks bigger at the bottom and then sort of disappears to um, a vanishing point at the top. Um, and that use of that leading line, so you, UI again here is starting on the bottom left um, and travelling up that um, Baroque diagonal. Contrast, repetition, patterns, the dynamic diagonal, all at play there, that use of light. Rennie Burry, so this image, lots going on in this one. Um, you can divide the frame up into thirds, into vertical thirds. Um, you've got things going on the hustle and bustle of the street on the left hand side, um, way down at street level with the traffic. And then you've got on the right hand side, you've got the four figures walking, um, stark contrast to the background, really elongated shadows, giving you an idea of that time of day, maybe late afternoon. Um, and then the skyscrapers in the middle third there. Rodchenko again, that use of um, corners, diagonal perspective, low vantage point. Low vantage point again, Lucien Hervé this time. Real symmetry and use of corners. This one's um, almost looks like two pictures stuck together, um, but that use of all the man made structure and that very stark contrast um, of the man made brick. Um, and then the figure stood next to it and then on the right hand um, we've got that nature and the tree and the grass there. Lovely division of the frame. That looking through frames and use of frames in your work. So we've got Ranger Pass here um, working with an architect same as Lucy and Hervé did um, and that use of windows as well and just the fact that these three windows are all open at slightly different angles is kind of dividing the existing frame of the photographer up into lots of other frames. <clears throat> this also leads on um, mirroring shapes of the windows behind as well. Hervé as well, very famous for his contact sheets um, and this particular photo shoot um, he did during the course of a day 
um, and photographed the building um, and he was particularly interested in the sun moving round and creating different shadows so all the same building but very different images um, taken as the light moves around and different shapes are cast so you've got a really quite abstract image. Again use of abstract shapes um, you've got really lovely use of corners and diagonals here, you've got the texture of the floor but then the light coming in um, and use on both of the dynamic diagonals are there as well, Helen Bine. Edward Weston, um, use of texture, um, depth of field, you get great depth of field there. Now images don't always have to have lots going on in them. Um, this example of Andreas Gursky um, is use of horizontal lines um, and a number of different horizontal lines and very muted um, colour palette also. And it's that sort of lack of um, things going on that actually make it really effective. He also here uses an idea um, that some photographers refer to as the middle line. Um, or the magic middle um, by placing the horizontal directly in the middle of the frame which can be unusual um, lots of people might position that so that it was up on the third but in this case that division of horizontal lines um, is what makes it quite effective um, this was also um, he does photoshop manipulation to quite a lot of his work um, and he'd removed a small factory and a dog walker as well um, and this was until quite recently um, the most expensive photograph um, in the world at 4.3 million. Um, Peter Lick has apparently um, bumped that off the top spot um, with the Phantom. So, um, so just as a reminder, um, you might be new to taking pictures, you might um, be already very accomplished at taking photographs and just want to get better it might be a refresher to sort of um, rethink and reevaluate your photographs and how aware you are when you're taking pictures of considering things like composition and framing um, it ultimately um, takes practice so we've got some um, practice shots here looking at various different elements Another thing that you can consider is where you select the focus in the image. Um, so you've got depth of field, shallow and great depth of field. This would be an example of shallow depth of field where the background is blurry and the foreground is nice and sharp. Um, and that's also use of selective focus. So you've actually asked the camera lens to focus on that. And that can be really key in um, which area you want your viewer to focus on. And we've got a nice use of... Um, repetition and light and contrast there as well. Again practice shots here. Looking at perspective and selective focus. Thinking about where you position the camera, thinking about how you might split the frame as well. Always challenging, we take a lot of photographs at mid-height um, so it's being aware of positioning the camera, low vantage point, high vantage point, against buildings, along the floor, um, so that it looks different um, and getting away from that sort of mid-height at taking photographs and really thinking about your framing. And then focusing on architecture in this particular example, we've then got some building shots as well. So then before going out and taking photographs, um, always being very aware of looking and noticing things and thinking about how I will frame um, the elements here, how, how I'll create that balance and um, what happens if I move my camera slightly over to the left or right or take it to a different vantage point perhaps. Um, so really thinking about where will I place my camera and being very sort of conscious of that decision um, and by doing that you will get um, better at framing, better at seeing um, and better at noticing things.
always thinking about the four corners of the frame. Whatever you place inside it, you're telling the viewer that that is important. And then ultimately, it's about practice, practice, practice. The more photographs you take, um, the better you will get at taking photographs, uh, the better images you will get. Um, the less likely you'll be to miss shots and the more accomplished you'll become at actually visualising things and noticing things before they actually happen. And practice is incredibly important. As we all know, our first 10,000 photographs are our worst. <laughs>